Hey, 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 closet busters and bold move makers. It is time once again for Life Hun Closet. So I want you to gather around because it is time once again to kick down those closet doors of your life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens. I'm the bold move expert and that coming out guy who's going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life on closet. So come on along with me and grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step into facing your fears, making your bold moves, and living life without apologies. Now let's get to the show. Hey, 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 Life Uncloseted family. It is time once again to step out of our closets, to dump our excuses, face our fears, and to live life without apologies. And one of the hardest spaces to live life without apology is when someone chooses to end their life for whatever reasons. And there may be apologies that are left in a note. There may be apologies building up to it that they're constantly apologizing for who they are. And then there may be no apologies or anything that anybody can see. In fact, um, I recently experienced this with a friend of mine who took their own life and it came from a space of shock. And I felt like this would be one of the best times to bring an acquaintance of mine who's become a friend of mine through another organization that I work with. She's a speaker whose son actually committed suicide and she has been out on the speaking circuit trying to share the story, create um, really heartfelt awareness about how we should talk about these things. And I'm really excited, even though that sounds weird to say, I'm excited to bring this person to the podcast, but I am because I think it's time to have some real conversations that this is a mental health issue This is something that a lot of times we can't see the signs of someone who is struggling. And even though she has gone through this tremendous loss, I feel she is one of the best voices coming into this world at this stage, talking about these sort of things. So I want to welcome my friend Ann Moss Rogers to Life Uncloseted, where we are going to uncloset a lot of discussions around suicide. So Anne, thank you for being here and joining me on such a very sensitive and personal subject for you personally. Well, thank you so much for having me. And right off the bat, I'm going to, I'm not, not to word shame you, but I'm going to point out that the phrase committed suicide is from the 1600s when Mm -hmm. suicide was actually a crime and that you're probably thinking, well, how can that be? Mm-hmm. And when somebody would kill themselves, they would shame the family and they would not allow them to bury their loved ones in a cemetery and they would find them. And today we know it as a public health issue. Yeah. So we're, we use the phrase killed himself, herself, died by suicide, or in the case of a different pronoun, killed themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but we no longer want to use committed with the word suicide because it is not a crime. Yeah. But, you know, uh, when somebody is suffering deep emotional anguish. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because you and I have talked about that in the past and I wanted to make sure this was part of the <clears throat> conversation, but we get so used to saying certain things and <laughs> Before you know it, it's like there's new terminology. And especially in my world, in the LGBTQ world, there are so many different phrases that whether it's about coming out or being queer, and then suddenly everything kind of changes. And it's really important, I believe, and I think you'll back me up on this, to honor how we approach certain things and use the terminology that best fits for the situation at hand. So um, let's kind of step back to this experience. And Anne has just recently put out a book about her experience. And she, as I said, she's getting out there on the speaking circuit, um, trying to create awareness. But let's step back to when this occurrence happened with your son. Um, Did you see it coming? Did you have any inkling of him struggling? I did have an inkling of him struggling. We had the last five years of his life were really chaotic for our family. And he had started um, abusing drugs and alcohol Mm -hmm. around in ninth grade, five years before he died. Hmm. And I couldn't figure out why he was defaulting to that kind of coping strategy 
because he was the funniest, most popular kid in school. So I, you know, was unaware that he was suffering from depression and our attempts locally to try to get a diagnosis. Nobody ever gave us a diagnosis. And that was that was pretty awful because mm-hmm. they kept giving him medication, just kind of like, well, let's see if this works. And they don't do that with heart patients. They do diagnostics first. So right. it, it wasn't until I had him, my husband and I had him kidnapped out of his bed and taken to a wilderness program. Mm. And Rick, you don't do that because you caught your kid with a beer and a joint. You do right. that because you have truly reached a desperate point and I was in fear for my child's life Mm -hmm. and looking back I still don't know was that the right thing to do sure but his drug use had escalated to a point I didn't think he would live to the end of the month Mm. and so he went to therapeutic boarding school he after the wilderness and he came home in 2014 having spent about 22 months outside of our home in some kind of placement he did graduate from high school in that time Mm -hmm. and once he got back home well guess what nothing in virginia had changed and certainly there were not more supporting organizations for kids his age and I still had a difficult time getting psychiatric appointments and therapist appointments and after a while they turned into kind of expensive no-shows because he wasn't going to them right he had lost faith in the system and quite frankly I can't blame him but I at that point he went on his own path and that was he, he met heroin, and that love affair ended with his suicide. And we actually got the news. I was sitting in the back of a police car in a parking lot when they told me that they had found my son dead. And Rick, I was sure it was overdose. Positive it was overdose. But my husband asked, how did he die? And that's when the policeman said it was a suicide. And that was the moment where I said, how could I be such a crummy mother that my child would check out on me? But Rick, it wasn't about me. And it took me a long time to figure that out. My son was suffering unimaginable pain from depression, which he was ultimately diagnosed with at Wilderness, Mm -hmm. and withdrawal symptoms of addiction when he took his own life. And those are two big things. I mean, I have worked in that <clears throat> arena in some of my own personal experiences with family members. And you see, you kind of sit there and as much as you love that person, there are times you go, I don't get it, which it really isn't for us to get. It's more for us to try to wrap our head around, well, how can I understand this and be supportive? But yet part of the reason I feel like this podcast is such a good medium for people to understand what uncloseting means. It's the same thing as coming to terms with drug abuse or alcohol abuse or sex addiction or whatever. We may not be able to get it, but all we're required to really do, and I hate to even use the word required, is just be understanding and empathetic and try to do what we can in it. I can't get how a family member feels about that stuff, but what I can do is show up and be as supportive as I can. And I think that's part of the problem that I know for me, when I've showed up and been supportive, I'm like, but why isn't that enough? Why doesn't that help? And so I'm wondering how, how much you came to those crossroads before, as you said, you finally realized it really wasn't about you. Well, prior to when he was struggling with um, drugs and alcohol, I would try to talk about it um, <clears throat> to some of my friends or groups, and I would get shut down. People would cut me off mid-sentence. They didn't want to hear it. They wanted to hear about the successes and they were willing to rally around, say there was a child getting a, um, a kidney transplant and Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. all rallied around her and boy, I just got cut off. Like what I had to say didn't matter. Right. And you know, the message was loud and clear. We don't want to hear 
any of that negative stuff. Mm. And I felt very alone and isolated. Mm. So in 2014, about a year before he died, he was in boarding school and I wrote an article and I thought, nobody will ever read this article. And it was a tiny little article and a hometown paper in Richmond. And boy, it, it didn't go viral, but it went all over the world. And I was really shocked at the number of comments and the number of people who were also suffering as I was. Mm -hmm. So after he died, what I realized is that the reason I didn't recognize that my son was suicidal and it was a preventable death is because I wasn't educated and I didn't recognize the signs of suicide. And he put on social media, what would be considered the bullet points under the phrase, what do people thinking of suicide say? So one of those was, if I died, no one would notice for 30 days. The word burden comes up a lot. Well, I'm just a burden. 85% of those who die by suicide leave some kind of clue. But we're not educated on what those clues are. And when we do get that feeling in our gut, we tend to just stop and walk away because we don't know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. But we're not supposed to fix it. We're supposed to just listen and connect with that person. So in addition to the speaking, I'm also a safe talk trainer, which is Mm -hmm. suicide alertness for everyone. And I do those trainings so that we create a suicide safe community and a suicide alert community so that people recognize those, what we call invitations. Because when people say that and they put it out in public or they send you a text or they tell you that over the phone or in person, they're actually inviting you to ask them, you know, are you thinking of suicide? And we're too afraid to ask that because we think that talking, about suicide gives somebody the idea mm-hmm. but actually asking that question invites people to say oh my gosh yes they what I found that most people want to be asked and it's up to us to listen so we can at least listen because mm-hmm. most of the time just sitting down and saying hey dude talk to me right is really enough and just keeping your mouth shut and your right. ears open. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's so interesting because I'm seeing this in some other patterns in some other areas. So Anne and I work together in um, a speaking group that I coach and she was one of the clients that I worked with. And as I'm working with a couple other people in the speaking group, it's so interesting to see the things that people shy away from. And two of the people that I'm working with are wanting to speak about divorce and they're having a really hard time finding places to speak about divorce because nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. They want help after the fact or they want help getting through a divorce, but nobody wants to talk about what can be done when you do go through a divorce. They want to like it. We don't want to know about it until it happens. And I feel like what you just shared is a very similar thing. It's like, okay, we don't want to talk about this because it's such a negative thing. Yet, if we would talk more about this, my feeling, and I think it's very similar to Anne's, we could probably prevent a lot of people from taking their own lives or at least give them the ramp to see that there's some possibilities and in that ramp time, potentially get them to the right people who could help them. Nothing's guaranteed, I know that, but... I think most of the time these people are subtly, as you just demonstrated, Anne, subtly crying out for help. But as you said, we have not been trained how to listen for those minor subtleties of I'm a burden or I feel really stupid or I feel like I'm not worthy of this. I listen to those sort of things because of the work I do, and especially given that a lot of the people that I do a lot of work with are LGBTQ because it's one of those things that I'm always aware that if I hear something like that, I'm not a therapist, but I definitely want to get them in that hands of someone who can really work with this. So as you encountered a lot of this, 
don't want to hear this, what kept you moving forward? Because that's got to get really discouraging to always go, let's not talk about this. Let's talk about something else. What keeps you moving forward at this point? And I just got a rejection today from a grant and everybody at this college wanted me to come speak. And they, they put in a grant for me to come speak. And I just got word 15 minutes ago that they not, a, I mean, they didn't even give part of the grant. So it is a topic around which there is a whole lot of rejection. Mm -hmm. But there are some places and pockets where I'm invited to come mm -hmm. talk about it. But in the spaces that really need it, like you say, there's a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. And But every time I get to the point as like, why don't I go back to speaking about women in business and digital marketing? Because mm -hmm. that was a lot easier. <laughs> I will get a message from somebody that says, a post you put out there saved my life last night. Mm -hmm. And I get those pretty frequently. Or I read your book, and this, this is what we went through. And, you know, they'll talk to me about a certain point in the book that spoke to them. And I guess that's why I keep going. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that the suicide rate across the board has gone up 25%. Mm. And for males 10 to 17 years old, it's gone up 70% in our wow. country. And that, for African-American males 10 to 17, it's gone up 77%. Mm. That is it's it's mind-boggling and to think of all the parents that are going to go through what i've been through over the last four and a half years mm -hmm. it is a brutal grief journey it is a traumatic grief mm -hmm. murder and suicide are both traumatic grief mm -hmm. and i'm not going to say it hurts more that it's not possible for my hurt to hurt more than somebody you know who lost yeah. a child to cancer but there are more questions as it pertains. You, you take it more personally. And you've got to work through that whole personal piece of I wasn't good enough. My love wasn't enough. And you have to come to an understanding that you finally forgive yourself mm -hmm. for that. And I'll be honest with you, Rick. I was really petrified about dragging this topic into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was... I put out a story after my son's death and it was about six months after he died. And it took me that long to write it because when you're in that fog of grief, you're not, you're not a good writer. Right. Right. <clears throat> and so it was 1200 words, but when I finally crafted it, I was really proud of it. I sent it to the newspaper. I spent this great sigh of relief. I'd worked through a lot of difficult pain with that writing the article but it was different when they came back in february and said it's published it's on the front page wow and, and then i panicked mm -hmm. i didn't go into full panic attack but i felt the edges of it mm -hmm. and when they called me i had to pull over to the side of the road and i had to do a lot of positive self-talk because my first thought was, okay, it's published, but maybe nobody will see it and I just won't share it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, I'm also, that's not what you're about. You said you were going to take this public. This is part of that journey. Exactly. <laughs> and so I decided what I would do with, and my husband hadn't seen it. My mother hadn't seen it. My business partner. I mean, I just wrote it and sent it. And then right. nobody had seen it. So I thought, well, I better share it with my loved ones first. And I did that. And then I closed my computer. I cut off my phone. I took my dog and I went down by the river. And I said, 24 hours, I'm not looking at social media. My biggest fear after thinking about it for a long time down there wasn't telling my ugly personal story. It was more 
what if nobody read it? Mm. And I feel like I'm burying his memory after I had to bury my child. Mm. And I just had to kind of move from that. And what it what ended up happening is, is it went viral. Mm. And that one did go all over the world multiple times. And I mean, there were thousands and thousands of comments of other people reading their story in mine. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was my first debut into get out there and do this. Be bold. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bold thing to do. As you were speaking, I was thinking of my own journey. And when I first decided I was going to really talk about the dirty, ugly stuff of my coming out. And at first I was just doing it in colleges and universities and classrooms. I'm like, okay, this is, you know, I hate to say it. I'll never see these kids again. So, you know, I'm just going to do it. And then the more that I started doing it, I'm like, I really started, I started seeing some of the kids over and over because I might be in a psychology class one time. And then the next time I'd be in a gender studies class. And then the next time I might be speaking at a diversity inclusion week, you know, and I'm like, Ooh, I am starting to see these same kids again. And I had to get out of my head about, wait, this has nothing to do with me. The reason I'm speaking about this is because I don't want to see another student at age 18, 19, 20, which was when I first came out of the closet. And then I made the conscious decision due to pressure from parents and society and everything to go into the closet. I don't want to see another student go through that. And as soon as I was able to latch on to that and go, okay, yes, this is about me as far as my story, but this is about them that I want to prevent them from doing something that is so not aligned with who they are. And then as soon as I made the transition from, and it's just not about the LGBTQ thing, I was totally good with it. And I realized this was what I was called to do. But it took a lot of like, oh my gosh, I just put this out there. And when I was on national TV, I'm like, oh my gosh. But yet, the minute I stepped away from my own ego, which is where that all resided and said, this is something that I'm giving back. I'm giving some hope. I'm, I'm giving someone out there will hear this. And even to this day, every time there's a podcast that goes out, I almost always get a minimum of one comment back up that helped me so much. And sometimes it's way more than one. And I think this is why we do the stuff we do, even though there's pain, there's a lot of pain tied up in my journey, your journey. But then when you hear numbers like 70% and 77% increases in young men committing suicide, we have a problem. We have a huge problem. And, it, and I believe, as you've already stated, Anne, that there are things we can do to help to quell this, this disease, this travesty that's happening. And, as you threw those two numbers at me, I'm like, I heard myself say, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because I'm going to first come from my LGBTQ space. I know that in that, that percentage of males, that there's probably a good 20 to 30% of those guys that are doing this because they're hiding their sexuality. Yes. Especially when you get to the African American population. So you take 30% of those out of the equation then you have the rest of them that are feeling pressured or bullied or you're not man enough. Even if you're not gay, you, this is what men have to do. And there's all this pressure. And then you switch it over to the female population and there's, you've got to look like this and you got to have this and you got to be pretty and you got to be, it, it's, it's, it's so insane the pressure we put on ourselves as human beings. And I would hate, and you and I have talked about this, I would hate to be a kid in this day and age because the pressures are so crazy, even though most of the pressures are coming from places that the pressure doesn't even need to come from. But yet to tell somebody to just be themselves is even a pressure. I actually said that to a college student once in the, and he looked at me and goes, and how the fuck do you do that, Rick? How do you be yourself? And I said, it's the hardest, most bravest thing you do is to find who you are and to stand in it. And I said, I can't tell you in like five minutes here how to do it, but just trust that if you are who you are, you're going to love yourself a whole lot more. And that's probably one of the first signs when you start really just loving yourself and you don't care about anybody else's thoughts that you will begin to discover who you are. And I think this is what challenges many people, not just kids your son's age, but especially kids your son's age, 
is we haven't taught them how to be themselves. All we teach in our world these days is be like this and be like them and have this and have that. So I'm curious, did you feel that now that you can look back and you, your eyes are open and you've gone through this personal experience, do you feel that your son was trying in some way to have to live up to some expectation that he just didn't feel he could, or was there just the deeper stuff in his own being that he just couldn't cope? I think that it, one of his, um, in the book, I have included some of his song lyrics mm -hmm. that give the reader a perspective from his point of view. And one of his songs says, I wear the mask of a clown. I feel so in love uh, for the monster created from drugs. Mm. So he felt a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the funniest, most popular kid in school was depressed and he didn't want anybody to know it. But and yet, he was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing, and I know you know, you probably know this now that, I mean, now that you've reflected and you see all this, the funniest kid in the class is usually doing that to hide something else. Yeah. The most popular kid in a class, that popularity is a mask, you know, and it takes a long time for us to figure these things out. But I see that so often. If I'm the most popular kid, the funniest kid, the most liked kid, then whatever I'm doing is probably hiding something that I don't want anybody to see. Rare, I mean, a lot of times it is, they just happen to be that. But I have seen more people, especially in my world, that those things are the masks that keep them from being found out. I know for me, yeah. I was the guy, Rick was, and I even talk about this in my talks, you know, Rick was that great guy. Look at him. What a great dad he is. He's a good husband. He's, he's always the guy that's willing to step in and help anybody out. Every one of those things was a mask because as long as I'm the great husband, I'm the good dad. And I'm the guy who's always willing to help anybody out. Nobody's going to see this scary infidelity guy that's screwing around behind the scenes and living a whole secondary life until, and in my own way, until I had to kill myself. I had to kill the self that really wasn't who I was. Not literally, but metaphorically. Wow. Yeah. And that's what I did. I had to kill that self. The other self was there, but I had to kill all that other stuff in order for me to finally say, I can't do this anymore. And it's interesting when we talk about people taking their own lives and death by suicide, that there's actually some very deep parallels to when people come out of the closet, because when someone comes out of the closet, a majority of the person they have presented dies. And the reality of the person they've always been is birthed. And that's why it's such a traumatic experience for them and for families and friends, because it's suddenly like everything they thought about somebody is now just, it, well, a lot of times it's like, it's a lie. You've been living a lie. Well, why do you think we've been living a lie? I mean, even, even recently, I have done a couple of interviews where people are like, why did you live the lie for so long? I'm like, I lived the lie because society said, this is what you have to do yeah. to fit in. And it, I, I believe it's the same thing with many people who suffer with those thoughts of, I'm not worthy. I don't belong here. It's that piece of it's either I kill myself or I'm not living. And actually, it's both the same. <laughs> I'm going to kill myself so I don't have to live. Or if I don't kill myself, I, I, there's no reason to even live. I'm living, I'm already dead living the way I am. And of course, in your son's case, which is in many times the cases, the drugs have that added, added, you know, right it just adds on to it. It's that next layer of it causes that stuff to even be more, you know, prevalent. And it's just, I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. Um, I've had two family members who are addicts and I've watched it happen and it's scary. It so, is. So in, first of all, before we wrap up here, what's the name of your book? A Diary of a Broken Mind. 
And the subtitle is A Mother's Story, A Son's Suicide, and the Haunting Lyrics He Left Behind. Hmm. So what's the most compelling reason at this stage for you, Anne, to continue to share? Because I know this isn't, it's not easy. I mean, every yeah. time I get up on every time I get up on stage and talk about my stuff, there are the, there are those moments where I feel the break starting to come forward, and I and I don't hold it back. I mean, I I might Me fight neither. it a little bit, but I don't hold it back because then I'm just wearing another mask. If I'm gonna if I'm holding this back to make the audience feel more comfortable, I might as well not even be on stage. I agree with you. I I go out there and. That's probably why I don't, I'll never be a speaker that goes out there five times a week because the story is so personal mm -hmm. and why I incorporated the evidence-based training because it's not a personal story mm -hmm. and I, I don't have to be emotional and I often am emotional too. Mm -hmm. Now I don't completely lose it, but I definitely get misty and mm -hmm. I, I get choked up, but I have come to terms with that and I gave my per myself permission to feel that yep. um, with my audience. Mm -hmm. And then I've had audiences say, you're going to make me cry, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do that. That piece I will own. Actually, I, I say to audiences that know I'm getting up on stage, I say, they'll be like, are you going to make us cry? I'm going to, I say, I'm going to make you cry and I'm going to make you pissed off at me. And then I'm going to make you love me. And they don't know quite what to do with that. I'm like, well, I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> I love that. You're going to hate me. And I make you're going to love me and you're going to cry. So get ready. Buckle up. We're going for a ride. And I do make people laugh too. I mean, exactly. people think I'm, there's no way somebody during a speech about my story is, is going <laughs> to, is going to laugh, but Charles is funny. Mm -hmm. And there's some funny stories, and I like mm -hmm. to include those. But if you didn't share that piece, again, then there's a there's a there's a mask put, being put over part of the story, right? And uh, you know, I would never say, "Well, suicide is funny," but we have to we have to see the humor in parts of the story that lead people to suicide because mo a lot of people I know, including my friend who just recently committed suicide, he was a funny guy. He was genuine. He was the biggest warm hearted guy, but he had like this just snide sense of humor that he would least oh. expect out of nowhere. He'd say something and the whole room would just be breaking up laughing because it was so unexpected from him but it got delivered in such a beautiful way. And if I didn't share those pieces of the story, it doesn't help the audience know that person. It doesn't help them see that that was part of who they were as much as a part of the drugs or as part of the depression or any of that stuff. And that's why I openly talk about being depressed myself on this podcast a lot. It's like, I suffer from depression, but I don't call it suffering from depression. I live a life with depression. And I keep moving through it because like you, I'm not going to use the wrong terminology. I live with depression. And sometimes I even say I thrive through depression. But I think it's Yeah, not, that's, it's and that's tough. Um, tough. And to a 15 year old, that's particularly, particularly, particularly tough. difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is high in the LGBT community, yep. um, suicide and suicide attempts, especially yep. at the age where kids are coming out. Mm -hmm. Because how many parents, you know, reject that child, mm -hmm. say you're out of the house and all of a sudden they're homeless right. and they feel hopeless. Yeah, absolutely. So if anybody could take something away from this conversation today, what would be the thing you'd most like them to be able to take and put into action and say, this helped me, this is something I could take and actually really make a difference in, in maybe their own life or somebody else's life. What would you like them to take away? Anne? Connection is the antidote to suicide. Mm. So connect with a person. It's the greatest gift that you can offer another human being is tell me more. And not try to say phrases like, you have so much to live for, but tell me more. And just ask questions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you can even ask, you know, how well were you planning to follow through with this? That's okay. Mm -hmm. But you want to do some active listening and then you want to follow up with that person, you know, the next day because often they feel ashamed if, if that's possible. And it's mm -hmm. not always possible. Right. Right. In but fact, it, the, it is, it is the connection. The, it is the connection and it, it isn't, it isn't easy to ask the question. If you were going to do this, how would you do it? But a lot of times, if you don't get an answer, then you know the person's actually, they're in that depressive state. They may be having a cross over their minds, but if they don't have a plan, there probably isn't going to be anything they're going to do. Somebody who's going to do it will probably say, oh. I, I got I to stop you there. That's actually not true. Um, and that's what we assume, and it's a myth. Hmm. Somebody who actually you know, if, if you talk to a therapist, they'll tell you that. But studies have shown that people can be very impulsive mm -hmm. and just follow through with something or not tell you a plan that they already had. So we have to take every threat seriously. Interesting. And because that's always been, that's where I've always operated from. And that's where I got some training from. So I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad I went there today because I want to make sure that we are dispelling some of the things we think to be true. I've always felt, even though that's what people have told me, and I've had good therapist friends say, hey, if they're going to do something, they'll have a plan. I'm like, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. But I'm like, if I had a plan, I don't know why I'd talk about it. Because if I really wanted to do it, I'd just do it. And I know through my own journey, in the few times that there's been that thought in my head, I didn't really have a plan because every time I thought about what would I do, I don't like any of the plan. <laughs> I don't want right. to, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, wreck a car or kill somebody else. I don't want to hang myself. I sure the hell, I don't like guns. So that's way out of the realm of anything that's going to happen. I almost drowned when I was a child, so that's not going to happen. So it's so interesting to hear. And I always kind of challenge in my own mind when people would say that, but as a coach, this was one of the things that I got handed is if you feel like a client's going to do it, ask them how they might do it. Because if they can't tell you, then they're probably, they're, I'm not going to say they're not, serious but there's they're not as actively engaged in making it happen as possible and I always question that I'm like I don't think I don't see that to be true because if they really want to do it they're probably not going to tell anybody how they're going to do it right well sometimes they do sometimes they're dying to tell you yeah it's everybody has a different invitation it. exactly exactly right it's and they have the way I've looked at it and you just never know because children can be very impulsive right. and uh, you know another myth I thought was somebody called me um, one time from a bridge mm. and she said that she was afraid she would be disabled and I said mm. well you're right you could be <laughs> exactly you know I, I'm not gonna dispel that fear it is highly likely Mm -hmm. that that could happen mm -hmm. and there are a lot of myths that we think like oh well they're not in this group they're not in this age group that's high probability but again if we do that then we miss 80 percent of the people dying by suicide yep. Yep. and we don't want to do that so we don't want to put them in a group or assume that because they're this ethnicity and they're this gender that they're not a high risk because Absolutely. it's all very personal. Well, Anne, thank you so much for being here and sharing yourself and coming out of the closet to talk about something that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially when it's your own child and especially when you've gone through this. And I, you know that I love the work you're doing and I'm a huge supporter. And I think the more that we enable these conversations to come out of the closet, no pun intended, but literally we bring these conversations out of the dark corners, out of the recesses where we don't talk about things like this, the more impact we can have and the better we can be for everyone involved from the person who is in the moment to the family and friends and loved ones and everyone surrounding that person who go, I never saw that coming. So thank you for being you and sharing um, everything you did. We will have every way to get a hold of Anne, get a hold of her book, um, to really take a, a look at um, what she does in this world and 
hire her to come speak at your, your group or your event and talk about the things that you can do to really move through this sort of stuff. So thank you so much for being here, Anne. Thank you for having me, Brooke. I really appreciate it. Hey, 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 Life Uncloseted family. Another episode of Life Uncloseted has come to an end and it is time for all of us to sashay away and go face our fears, make those bold moves and stand up to living our life without apology. But before you do, I've got a favor to ask of you. Would you hop over to iTunes or Spotify or Podbean or wherever it is that you're listening to this and just give us a little bit of love if you like what we're doing here at Life on Closet. Here's what it does. It helps other people find the show. It helps other people get to know what we're all about and you just might help change your life. In fact, if you really want to change your life, We'd love it if you just ask a friend to take a listen and see what they think. So that's it. Love you all deeply. I'm Rick Clemens, the host of Life Uncloseted, and never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping in to living your life uncloseted.